Okay, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to the first meeting um, this uh, academic year of the Northern California Synthetic Geometry Seminar. And our first uh, it's our pleasure to have our, speak our first speaker today, Yaniv Ganor from Technion, who will talk about uh, big fiber theorems and ideal valued measures in synthetic topology. Hello. Yaniv? Yeah, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this great opportunity to, to share my work with you and with such a broad audience. And let me uh, share the screen now. I could, could have our slides. And just let me know, can you see my slides? Is everything okay? Great, great. So our, our talk today will deal with, as the title says, uh, big fiber theorems and ideal valued measures in uh, symplectic topology. Now, uh, we will start with describing uh, three big fiber theorems and what I mean by a big fiber theorem. Uh, then we will move to uh, this concept of ideal valued measure due to Gromov which uh, can be used to prove uh, two of those uh, two big fiber theorems that I'm going to describe. And later we will pass to uh, its uh, adaptation into the symplectic world, uh, which we call the uh, ideal valued quasi-measures, uh, with which we will prove the third big fiber theorem that we will uh, uh, describe. And uh, we will see how to import the other big fiber theorems into the realm of uh, symplectic topology. Then we will finish with uh, some discussions of uh, symplectic rigidity via this uh, ideal valued lens and say a few words about the construction of our IVQM, ideal valued quasi-measures. So let's start with, with what do I mean when I uh, say big fiber theorem? So in various fields of mathematics, you have theorems that suit the following template: that for any map in a suitable class of maps, you have a fiber which is considered big, where of course the notion of size uh, depends on uh, the context. So, uh, I want to discuss three examples today. So the first, I will present the topological center point theorem, which goes back all the way to Rado, but we will present a version uh, by Karasov. Uh, then I would like to present to you uh, Gromov's uh, maximal fiber for the torus. So those two, first, th those two theorems are, have topological uh, flavor. The first one is more combinatorial. The second is more algebraic uh, topology. And Third, there is the non-displaceable fiber theorem in symplectic topology uh, due to Antov and Polterovich. Uh, and basically the main goal of this project uh -huh. is to come again, was there a question? Uh -huh. I think someone's microphone is uh, open or something. So uh, the goal of this project is uh, to take Gromov's notions of uh, ideal valued measures, which was used in proving those first two theorems, and combining it with the uh, relative symplectic homology due to von Gunesch, in order to put all three of those theorems on equal footing. Now, by the way, I cannot monitor the chat while I'm seeing the slides. So if there are any questions, please either just speak or someone will monitor the chat probably. So uh, I want to start with the topological center point theorem. So let Y be a metric space of covering dimension D. And by that, I mean what's called the bag covering dimension. That is any covering of Y can be refined as such that each set uh, intersects at most D plus one other sets. So it's a topological notion of a dimension and fix P some positive integer. So denote by N the product of P and D plus one and take the N simplex. So Karasov's theorem says that for any continuous map from that simplex to Y, we have a fiber that intersects all the PD dimensional faces of the simplex. So in that case, the notion of size being a big fiber means that we intersect uh, all the faces of high enough uh, dimension. So for a fine map, this was proved by Rado and Karasov proved it for all continuous maps. And just an example of what kind of statement this theorem says is that, for example, if we fix D and P to be one, take N to equal two, then we have a two simplex and we see some projection onto a line. And indeed we have a point 
uh, who, whose fiber intersects all three faces, one dimensional faces of the simplex. Second, we have Gromov's torus theorem. And again, Y will denote a metric space of dimension D and P is any positive integer. This time N is at least the product of P and D plus one. And Gromov's theorem states that any continuous map from the N dimensional torus to a D dimensional space must have a fiber such that the rank of restriction in cohomology is big. Namely here, it's at least a two to the pth power. So here the notion of size is being measured uh, by the rank of the restriction map in cohomology. So used to some technical uh, reasons that we will encounter later, uh, this uh, theorem is stated for Czech cohomology and not for a, a singular cohomology. And just as an example of what kind of statement uh, this theorem claims. So if we take a, a the usual two dimensional torus and project it on the first factor. So assume I'm projecting on the factor that goes like this. Um, then indeed the fiber or actually over any point is a circle as drawn. And the image of the restriction map on cohomology, well, it contains the unit and it contains what I denoted by dy where y is this direction uh, going along the circle. So indeed the rank is two, which is two to the power one as uh, promised by the theorem. Now, the non-displaceable fiber theorem due to uh, Antov and Polterovich looks on the, on the surface very different from the previous two. So we have a closed symplectic manifold and we have some map into Rn such that any pair of its components Poisson commute, namely their Poisson bracket is zero. And the non-displaceable fiber theorem states that there exists some point such as the fiber of the, over this point is non-displaceable. So for example, uh, for the height function on the sphere, this theorem actually shows us that the equator is non-displaceable. Well, I mean, an example of the statement of this theorem is that the equator is not displaceable. I mean, one of the fibers should be the equator and we know it to be non-displaceable. Or other way, otherwise you could argue that if you take the theorem to be true and you can displace any other fiber since it guarantees the existence of at least one, you can show that certain fiber is non-displaceable. Now, for the ideal valued measures, which were introduced by Gromov, uh, to prove his theorem, and actually uh, Karasov's theorem can also be proved using them. So let us fix some graded skew commutative associative unital algebra, and just think of the Czech cohomology of some compact Hausdorff uh, space. So this is our algebra. And an ideal valued measure is an assignment that assigns to any open set some graded ideal in that algebra, such that a, a list of axioms is satisfied. And what these axioms model, they model the behavior of kernels of restriction map in cohomology, specifically the kernel of the restriction map to the complement of the set. So just think of mu as uh, the kernel of the restriction, the complement to you. So indeed it satisfies this norm normalization axiom because while well, restricting to the complement of the empty set that's restricting to X, which has zero kernel, and restricting to the complement of X that's restricting to the empty set. So uh, the kernel is everything. And indeed, as we expect, we have monotonicity. We have continuity. Well, continuity claims that if U is an ascending union of open sets, then it's a measure should be the union of measures. And for that, uh, for that axiom to hold, this, uh, this is the reason why we have to work with check homology because check is continuous uh, with respect to uh, limits. And next comes additivity, which claims that for these joint uh, sets, we have that their me the measure, measure of their union is the sum of the ideals corresponding to each set. And basically this is a sum manifestation of the meyer vietoris property because if, we, if you consider the Maya Vietoris long exact sequence, uh, you see that for this joint sets, we have that the union, uh, the intersection, sorry, is the empty set. So one term vanishes there and the manifestation of that vanishing actually can be translated 
into that additivity uh, property. Uh, multiplicativity states that the product in the, in the algebra A, the product of uh, the measures of two sets should lie in the measure of their intersection. And the, the phenomena of this axiom models uh, can be seen in the Durham model very explicitly. Assume you have uh, some differential form um, vanishing on, so supported on U and another differential form supported on U prime, then their wedge is supported on the intersection. So this is the kind of uh, phenomenon that is axiom models. And the last axiom is, is the intersection property, which states that if we have two sets which cover X, then the measure of their intersection should be the intersection of measures. And again, this is related to the meyer vietoris property in cohomology. This time, we use the fact that if the sets cover X, then the union is everything. And again, this has some implications on the Maya Vietoris. Uh, note that uh, inductively, this property uh, uh, generalizes to collections of more than two sets, but the right condition is not that they form a cover, but rather that they pairwise cover. So it's a collection of sets such that pairwise they cover X, and then we have the, the, union, the measure of their intersection is the intersection of measures. So for example, as we've, as we've seen is the Czech cohomology IVM, which is given by the kernel of restriction to the complement in Czech cohomology. And another way to generate examples is the push forward construction. So assume I have some space X and an IVM on it, then for any continuous map to some other space, I can obtain an IVM on Y, which has nothing to do with the cohomology of Y, just by a push forward construction. Namely, I assign to each uh, open set on Y the measure of its pre-image under F. And now I would like to discuss uh, a sketch of the proof of Karasov's theorem. And the uh, crux of the proof lies on some abstract uh, theorem on IVMs, namely the abstract center point theorem. And it's a variation of, well, Karasov didn't use in his paper this language of IVM, but his arguments are very close to it. And what I present is a translation of his argument into this language. So let by Y as before be a compact metric space of covering dimension D. A is some algebra and assume there exists an ideal in that algebra such that it's a D plus one power is non-zero. And let mu be any uh, IVM on Y. Then the claim is that the set the collection of all sets whose measure contains this ideal must intersect non-trivially. That is, if I have in the algebra such an ideal, it gives me a scale to measure size of sets. And like we can say that sets whose measure, contain this, whose measure contains this ideal are actually so large that their entire collection must share a common point. So pictorially, just think of it like this, so we have some collection of sets, and I know that each of them, so I, I pictorially describe the, the ideals as those planes, all of them containing I, and the theorem guarantees the existence of that green point in the picture, a point in the common intersection of all of them. And I would like to sketch a proof to show you how those axioms uh, um, actually uh, come into play and maybe get a little feel for how, how we work with them. So assume this theorem is wrong, then the collection of complements to those sets in this collection is an open cover. Now, a property of open covers on the spaces of covering dimension D is what's called Thalelema. And it states that the covering has a refinement such that the refinement can be colored in D plus one colors such that the sets of the same colors are disjoint. That is, we break down, we refine the cover such that it breaks down to a collection of D plus one uh, subcovers, such that each of them is a union of disjoint sets. And having done that, just denote by Ki the intersection of all the complements of the sets of the same color, I. So multiplicativity axiom 
uh, guarantees that the product of the measures of all those Ki should lie in the measure of their intersection. Now, their intersection is actually intersecting the complements of all the elements in a cover. And this gives us the empty set because, well, they are a cover that is every, uh, every point is not, is, in the, is not in the complement of one of them. So the intersection is empty. So it's enough to show that the ideal i belongs to the measure of each of those ki's. Because then we will have that we could use the fact that it's d plus one power is non-zero to get a contradiction. And indeed, this follows by the intersection axiom and the monotonicity. Uh, because the intersection dealt with collections which pairwise form a cover, and indeed those were, uh, those vi's were uh, um, uh, complements of uh, disjoint sets, so they pairwise uh, uh, form a cover. And by monotonicity, we actually get the desired uh, condition. So that was a sketch, and I would not, I would not, would not like to fully detail the whole set theoretic uh, verification of that. Just I wanted to give you some uh, kind of pictorial uh, way to think about it. And well, what do we do next? So. This gave us a, a point in some collection of sets, but we are actually interested in fibers. So how to pass from that to fibers? Well, here enters the push forward construction. So indeed, the corollary is that now if I have an IVM on any compact house door space, and I have some continuous map to Y, dimension D, then I have a fiber intersecting every compact uh, Z with this property that contains I. And the way to prove it basically is just to take the push forward IVM under F and apply the abstract center point to this push forward measure on Y. Then it's a matter of just set theoretic verification to see that indeed this guarantees the desired fiber. We need to sketch. Let us now see how, how this implies the uh, theorem on the simplex. So let, uh, let me remind you that what we want to do is to find a fiber intersecting all the PD dimensional faces of this N dimensional simplex. So in order to deduce this from the previous uh, corollary, we need to find some algebra A and an IVM U on the simplex such that first there will be such an ideal in the algebra whose uh, D plus one power is non-zero. So we will have this gauge with respect to which we can measure this uh, large size of the sets. And second, we would like that for every PD dimensional, PD dimensional face, the ideal I will belong to its uh, measure. And so how does one come up with uh, such an IVM? Well, consider the moment map, mapping from CPN to this N dimensional simplex. Then the pre-image of any face of uh, Delta is a complex projective hyperspace of the same complex dimension. That is the pre-image of the edges are a complex lines, uh, et cetera. So all we have to do is take the push forward IVM where we take the cohomological IVM on CPN and push it forward with the moment map. And as our ideal, we will take the Poincaré dual to the PD dimensional complex uh, hyperspace. And indeed, just by uh, the relation between a hub product and intersection of one correct dual of classes, we can show that indeed the d plus one power of the ideal is non-zero. And moreover, the reason that for any uh, PD dimensional phase, uh, the ideal belongs to its measure. Well, this, me this uh, IVM uh, has to do with, the inter with restriction to a complement. And indeed, once I restrict to the complement of, a, of some cycle in homology, uh, the class Poincaré dual to it uh, vanishes because it has nothing to integrate on to get something non-zero. So that's it, basically. So, so far, any questions about uh, what we, I, I have uh, described? Great. So just to say a few words on Gromov's Torus theorem, the proof has a very similar structure in the sense that 
we have two ingredients. First, we prove some suitable abstract center point theorem on IVMs, something of the form that there exists a point Y0 where the co-dimension of the measure of its complement is at least some lower bound. And second is the application, is the application of push forward IVMs to deduce something on the fibers. Now I would like to discuss the symplectic counterpart of all this story. Namely, ideal valued quasi measures. So the goals are threefold. So we want to adapt those IVMs to the symplectic setting. We would like to be able to apply center point theorems in the symplectic setting. And moreover, we would like to explore symplectic rigidity via this uh, ideal value the uh, viewpoint. And to introduce this uh, uh, IVQ and uh, those ideal valued quasi measures, I need to uh, discuss the definition of a commutation of subsets and involutive maps. Well, an involutive map is, you can think of a map from a symplectic manifold to RK such that any pair of components uh, is Poisson commuting. That is the Poisson bracket of them is zero and we call such maps involutive. More generally, any smooth map from M a symplectic manifold into B, just some manifold, any manifold, will be called involutive if for any two functions on B, their pullbacks form a Poisson commuting pair. So this is kind of a general globalization or a generalization of the first uh, definition, but actually not really because we can always embed B into some big RN and use the third, first definition. So what you should keep in mind is that involutive maps to some manifold are maps such that locally their components Poisson commute. Second, we say that a pair of compact sets in a symplectic manifold commute if they are the zero sets of a pair of commuting functions. That is, if there exists a pair of functions f and g with a zero Poisson bracket such that k is the zero set of f and k prime is the zero set of p. And we say that uh, open sets commute if their complements commute. So let me present two examples. So first, on the sphere, uh, consider two caps such that the, uh, their areas are more than half. So say each cap has an area of two thirds. So in this example, I have the blue cap going all the way down here. And I have the red cap from below going all the way up here. So they intersect, but their boundaries do not intersect. And indeed they are commuting because we can find the such F and G such that the derivatives of G are non-zero only outside the support of F and vice versa, because F is, for example, if G is zero all the way up here and somewhere here G has to change and start becoming non-zero, well, it doesn't matter to the Poisson bracket because the other function F is constant zero. So generally any pair of sets with no intersecting boundaries will be Poisson commuting. On the other end of the spectrum, in dimension two, if the boundaries of the sets intersect, they do not commute. Well, because you can just think of uh, the, the, uh, the symplectic gradients of uh, corresponding radial functions, and you will see that the symplectic gradients are not collinear. So the functions uh, do not Poisson commute. In higher dimensions, sets can be Poisson commuting while having intersections of the boundary. We will see examples later. So what is an ideal valued quasi measure? So it's the same as an IVM, except that we replace the multiplicativity axiom with a weaker notion. We demand that the product of two ideals would lie in the ideal corresponding to the intersection of sets only if those sets commute. Moreover, we demand two extra axioms to adapt into this uh, symplectic setting. So the first is invariance. We want uh, our IVQM to be invariant under a symplectic isotopism. And second, we want the vanishing. Well, the philosophy is that uh, 
displaceable sets should be considered small and we want our IVQM to respect that. So we demand that for, for a compact set, if it's Hamiltonianly displaceable, then there should be some open, neighbor, open neighborhood of it with a zero measure. And moreover, we would like the complement to have full measure. And one reason, the, another reason why we ask those axioms is well, because our construction, construction satisfies them. So why not use them? And our main theorem, by the way, I think I forgot to mention at the beginning, this is a joint work with uh, Adit Dickstein, uh, Leonid Polterovich, and Flor Zapolsky. Uh, our main theorem states that if given a closed symplectic manifold, there is an A IVQM for some algebra A, and secretly this algebra is going to be the quantum cohomology of the manifold. So the upshot of this, is that pre-images of sets under involutive maps commute. Hence, those IVQMs push forward to IVMs under involutive maps. And this is what allows us to import all this uh, uh, big fiber technology that was proven using IVMs into the symplectic setting. So we can gain symplectic analogs to Karasov's theorem and to Gromov's theorem. So let me present an example of an IVQM. So consider the sphere S2. So it's enough to define it on two dimensional closed connected submanifolds with boundary because we can approximate everything else just by uh, limits and unions of such a, a sets. By the way, similarly to many other theories of measures, we can actually discuss those IVMs and IVQMs either on open sets or on compact sets. And in each case, we have a corresponding list of axioms. And so I'm going to just discuss uh, interchangeably uh, according to the context uh, on open sets or on compact sets. So we will define some kind of a binary uh, uh, IVQM where we give the zero measure for a set that is contained in a smooth closed disk of area less than half, namely a displaceable set, and a full measure otherwise. So say a cap of area less than half will get the zero measure, but some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, neighborhood of the equator will get full measure. And indeed, one can just verify uh, by hand that uh, this satisfies uh, our uh, IVQM axioms, or one can also deduce it, at least for A being the quantum cohomology, uh, this description actually coincides with the IVQM that is guaranteed by our theorem. So in general, how do we uh, obtain those IVQMs? Well, we use the a theory of a relative symplectic cohomology uh, due to Valgunas. Well, symplectic cohomology has a very long history. It's actually going back to Floer, Hofer, Vysotsky, and uh, later at Silibak, uh, Viterbo, Treino, and Bourgeois, and Oancha, and I'm sure I have uh, forgotten to mention uh, other names. Uh, but one of the latest developments in this uh, uh, theory is given by Valgunas, and what he constructs is a homology for every compact set, for every compact set in M. And that homology actually depends on the ambient manifold. So it's actually an invariant of, uh, of this uh, embedding of the compact set in the symplectic manifold. And it's actually also a ring. This is due to Van Gunesh and Tonkonov. And so it comes with restriction maps from bigger sets to smaller sets, just like any homology should come. And one important property of it is that it satisfies a meyer vietory sequence for pairs of commuting sets. So if A and B form a commuting pair, then we have a meyer vietory uh, exact sequence. Moreover, it vanishes for displaceable sets. And our IVQM is going to be defined very uh, uh, similarly to uh, um, in other cases, sorry, for an open set, uh, you just define it to be uh, uh, the kernel of restriction to the complement. 
Well, there are, there are a few remarks in order here. So the first is, as I said, we can either discuss those on compact sets or on open sets. And second is that to achieve continuity, one actually has to alter this definition a bit. So the uh, unlike Czech homology, this uh, symplectic homology is not continuous or at least not known to be continuous. And so if we want to, to get something that satisfies all, the, all those axioms, I mean, that is the continuity axiom, we have to force it to be continuous by some regularization procedure where we actually uh, define the IVQM to be uh, the union of all measures of uh, compact sets contained in some open sets and vice versa for compact sets, we intersect all measures of the open sets containing it. Uh, and this kind of regularization actually uh, forces this to be uh, continuous. And most properties follow very similarly to how they follow for the Czech uh, uh, homology IVM, except from quasi-multiplicativity, -multiplic which is actually not trivial. And this is, this is the part where it requires new ideas and fills the bulk of uh, our uh, rather long paper on this. So let us now revisit big fiber theorems armed with this uh, uh, IVQM and see what we get. So first, let us go back to this non-displaceable fiber theorem. And we, can, we will see that this is actually an analog, symplectic analog to Gromov's theorem on the torus. So if we take Gromov's theorem and adapt it using those IVQMs to uh, the symplectic one, we get a quantitative version of the end of Kolterovich non-displaceable fiber, which reads as follows, that every involutive map from M to some manifold B has a fiber where the co-dimension of the measure of the complement of the fiber is at least one. So let us break this down a bit. So recall that the IVM or the IVQM had to do with restriction to the complement. So the measure of the complement of the fiber has to do with the kernel of the restriction map to the fiber. And co-dimension here has to do with taking some kind of a dual viewpoint. So this is very uh, uh, closely related with the rank of the restriction map in cohomology to the fiber. And indeed this generalizes the non-displaceable fiber because displaceability would have implied that the measure of the complement of the fiber would have been everything, that is its co-dimension would be zero. And moreover, actually Gromov gives lower bounds for this uh, quantity, the, this co-dimension, using some uh, algebraic invariance of the algebra A, which I will not go into, but that means that it's at least in some cases, this uh, theorem actually can guarantee uh, actually strictly larger than one co-dimension. Now, for the analog of Karasov's uh, uh, simplex theorem. So recall that I is some graded ideal whose d plus one power is non-zero, and now B replaces Y as a space of covering dimension D. So our analog says that every involutive map from M into such a B has a fiber which intersects all the members of the collection. And this is the collection you recall from before, all compact sets whose measure contains this ideal I. So it's a source of a new kind of examples of symplectic rigidity because this imposes uh, some intersection conditions on at least one fiber of involutive maps, which is not uh, uh, necessarily guaranteed if we just had some continuous uh, topological uh, map. Moreover, this again, he, in, in this case, the, this point of view that is the notion that having the fiber big means that it intersects a lot of interesting sets upstairs. So let us see how this plays in a concrete example. So take the six dimensional torus with coordinates pi, qi, and the standard symplectic form. And now for every uh, triplet of points, a, b, c on a two dimensional torus, we consider the following three co-isotropic subtori of T6. So each of those is a four dimensional torus, which is given by each time we restrict two of the six coordinates of the torus to some value. And we set T, A, B, C to be the union of these uh, tori. 
And why did we pick those tori? Well, we wanted to generate in the uh, cohomology an ideal whose piece, uh, 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 whose in this case third power will be a, a non-zero. And in order to that, we had to uh, uh, catch a, a enough uh, a generators of high enough degree. And the second point here is that we are working with this uh, symplectic homology, which is in general, general hard to compute. But in this case, the, in the case of say co-isotropic subtoral of a torus, we can compute uh, the kernel of restriction. It actually coincides with uh, what you get in usual cohomology. And our theorems then says that every involutive map from this six dimensional torus times the sphere into a two dimensional space has a fiber intersecting all sets of the form such T A B C times an equator. So why do I need this uh, uh, S2 uh, factor? Well, I want this example to be genuinely uh, uh, symplectic. And as I said on T6 and those tori, uh, the IVQM actually coincides with the IVM. So I will not have gained any uh, uh, genuinely symplectic obstruction, but on S2, uh, the IVM and the IVQM behave very differently. For example, the IVQM of the equator is the full measure, but the IVM of the equator contains only uh, the volume class. So we get uh, some kind of a new kind of a symplectic rigidity statement where such maps should intersect a lot of sets, actually. And the involutivity is essential for this uh, theorem to work, because had the map uh, not have been involutive, we could have just picked a uh, projection, symplectic projection to S2. Then for any point in S2, we can just find some equator not passing through it. And then the fiber will be disjoint actually from any set times this equator. So this theorem fails miserably if we uh, drop the involutivity assumption. Before I go on to discuss uh, some aspects of rigidity, this is a good time to pause for questions if there are any. Okay. So let now Tau denote our uh, IVQM uh, built on top of this uh, symplectic homology theory. And we define for a compact uh, set in M uh, we call it SH heavy if its measure is non-zero. So for example, on the torus, this uh, circle is SH heavy because as I said, it's a IVM is actually, the IVQM is actually the same as the cohomological IVM, which is non-zero. And on the sphere, for example, the equator has full measure because its complement can be exhausted by uh, unions of uh, displaceable sets. So you have here two examples of SH heavy sets. And they satisfy some nice property. So first they are a Hamiltonian a non-displaceable. This go, follows from the IVQM axioms. And moreover, we can show that if the product of measures of two sets is non-zero, so first trivially, of course, each of them is a SH heavy, because if one of those factors had been zero, then the product would have been zero. But moreover, we can show that one such, each, each of those sets is uh, non-displaceable from the other, even under a symplectic uh, isotopies, actually. So just an example of, of uh, this uh, property is, for example, here on the torus, I picked two sets, the green and uh, the red. They are actually already displaced from each other. And indeed, their product of measures is zero because their measure, the measure of such a, a loop in the torus, well, it will contain the volume class, the top dimensional cohomology, and it will contain what I called before dy. And indeed, this product of ideal with itself, so each of the combinations either gives you dy wedge dy, which is zero, or it gives you something of degree uh, three or more, which also is zero due to degree reasons. On the other hand, in this case where they intersect, well, you see that in the product you get dx wedge dy, which is non-zero. 
Now, for a more interesting example, we can actually deduce using this criterion that in T2 times the sphere, the product of the green torus, eh, sorry, the, the green torus and the cherry colored torus are non-displaceable from each other. So here inside this product, they have two torus, two, two tori. Each of them is given as a product. So the green one is a, pro is a product of this circle and some equator on the sphere. And the cherry one is a product of this dual circle and some other equator on the sphere. And actually this result has already been proven before us uh, by Kawasaki using a, a Lagrangian uh, uh, quasi-states. Uh, it's a totally different method, but we think that with uh, once we develop more uh, calculations with uh, this uh, symplectic homology, we could generate uh, new examples of such a non-trivial symplectic intersections. And of course, in this example, they are smoothly displaceable from each other because you can just shrink one of those circles to some small circle here, which doesn't intersect anything. Now, let me say a few words on why this uh, non-displaceability is true. Well, assume I have some symplectic isotopy which displaces K from K prime. So I get that the phi of K is disjoint from K prime. Then those two sets are commuting. So actually any two disjoint sets commute, basically from the same reason as I described before, you can pick those functions F and G such that uh, their supports will be uh, disjoint. Then by quasi-multiplicativity, we get that the measure, the product of measures of phi k and of k prime should be contained in, their, in the measure of their intersection, which is the measure of the empty set, which is zero. On the other hand, due to the invariance of this uh, IVQM under some plectic isotopies, we get that the measure of phi of k is actually equal to the measure of k. Hence, we get a contradiction that this product on one hand is non-zero, on the other hand should lie inside a zero ideal. So it's a contradiction. So basically this kind of uh, obstruction allows us to really uh, hide away all the floor and theory somewhere in the back and just use some algebraic manipulations to, to see stuff. Now, there existed a previous notion of a, a type of rigid sets in symplectic manifolds due to Antlov and Polterovich, which was called heavy sets. And it was con constructed using partial symplectic quasi-states, which are certain uh, homogenizations of uh, spectral invariance. So given an idempotent in the quantum homology, uh, the spectral invariant of an Hamiltonian uh, with respect to the idempotent gives you the lowest action uh, required to uh, find the representative of that class in the floor homology. And so one defines the partial symplectic quasi-states for any Hamiltonian by this limit of uh, the spectral invariance of k times f over k. So this is a certain homogenization procedure. And one says that a set is heavy if it determines, uh, at least gives a lower bound on the quasi-state in the following sense that the value of the quasi-state of any Hamiltonian is actually at least its infimum on that set k. And heavy sets actually enjoy very similar properties. They are non-displaceable. Sometimes they intersect, sometimes they don't. So think of the, that example on T2, where I took in one case two parallel meridians and on the other hand, two meridians which were transversal. And it is very unclear how to detect when two heavy sets intersect. In contrast to this SH heavy notion, which gives you a algebraic uh, condition that guarantees those, those intersections. And hence we conjecture actually that heavy implies SH heavy. And we managed to prove this in the simplest case, basically, which is a, the, case, the simplest case where we could actually compute everything. And that is index bounded uh, in compressible domains in aspherical manifolds. So for example, an example of such a domain is uh, say uh, uh, 
Weinstein neighborhoods of uh, Lagrangian tori in a torus. And the other direction is more speculative because at least from ju just by playing with the definitions and unwinding them, it seems that SH heavy kind of tells you something about those spectral invariants. It might tell you that they go to infinity, but it doesn't tell you anything about the rate. And on the other hand, heaviness, one can show, has to do with those spectral invariants uh, growing uh, at least linearly uh, in their asymptotics. So unless there is some kind of uh, miracle in the back that kind of dictates uh, certain possible asymptotics for such spectral invariants, or maybe there are finer properties that you missed, uh, the other direction is a bit more speculative. So I would not conjecture to either uh, uh, direction about it. So I would like to say a few words about more detailed construction of our IVQNs. But before I do that, that is again another time to stop and see if there are any questions about our story because this part is a bit more technical. Great. So I would like to present Vahalgunesh uh, relative symplectic uh, cohomology in a more detailed way. So to do so, we'll have to recall the Novikov ring and the Novikov field. So the Novikov field is given by all formal sums of powers of t, where the powers are allowed to be real numbers and the coefficients say are rational numbers, such that the coefficients in each sum, the, the exponents, sorry, they tend to infinity. That is, they do not have any finite accumulation point. And this is a field. And the Novikov ring is actually defined the same, only that the exponents are uh, not allowed to be negative. That is, they are all non-negative. And this is a ring. And given a Hamiltonian, let us denote by P of H the set of uh, one periodic orbits. And we can grade them by uh, the mod two comet center index. And the floor complex relevant to this uh, version of uh, relative symplectic homology is generated uh, over the Novikov ring by those one periodic orbits. So note that there are no cappings in this story, unlike the more common version of floor homology. Now, the floor differential, so first, since this is a cohomology, this counts positive gradient flow of the action functional. And second, most, more important, since there are no cappings, the differential is weighted by T to the power of what's called topological energy of the flow solution. So D of some uh, orbit gamma minus is a sum over all other orbits and the sum over all homotopy classes of cylinders between them. And as usual, you have the usual account of flow solutions between them. And you also weight the, the result with T to the power of this expression. And let's see, say we had we been in the aspherical, aspherical case where we could have defined action without, without any appeal to cappings, then this expression up here is actually the action difference between uh, gamma plus and gamma minus. So you can think of this weighting as the action difference. And moreover, we have continuation maps. And again, they are weighted by topological energy. And in order to be defined over uh, uh, the Novikov uh, ring, uh, we need this expression to be uh, non-negative. So they are only defined uh, for H1 uh, less than or equal uh, H2. That is, we are going from a lower Hamiltonian to a higher, to a greater Hamiltonian. So how does one define the uh, symplectic homology? Well, given a compact set K, we pick a sequence of Hamiltonians adapted to it in the following sense. They are all negative on K and they tend to zero on K. And on the complement of K, they all tend to infinity. Then one defines the symplectic homological complex as the limit of the floral complexes of those Hamiltonians completed with respect to the T-adic uh, topology. So let me say a few words about this completion. So first, one can just treat this algebraically. 
So this completion can be given as the inverse limit of the truncation. So you can truncate by uh, modding out higher powers of t, and you can take the inverse limit of those truncations. Or you can think about it uh, topologically. This, uh, uh, there is this uh, t adic topology where two things are considered close if their difference uh, amounts to a high power of t. So one can think of completion as completion with respect to the metric induced by this uh, t adic uh, distance. And this completion actually does two things. It gives you a complete metric space, and it also does some Hausdorffization. So this metric that I uh, mentioned before is actually a pseudometric. So two things can have distance zero if they are not equal, and this completion actually forces modding, mods out in th those cases. So why is it necessary here? Well, this is an algebraic way to eliminate the contributions of the upper orbits, that is the orbits that lie uh, outside of K in the upper part of the Hamiltonian. So for example, in the simplest case, consider a sequence of orbits that lies here in the part where H is almost constant. And assume for simplicity, I have some orbit that just being mapped to some other orbit above it. And then in the next continuation, it will be mapped to another orbit above it and so forth. So as I said, you can just think of this uh, topological energy as action difference. So assume that say the differences of those Hamiltonians are one at each step. So you will see a component in this limit corresponding to this kind of diagram. Some, some uh, collection of Novikov rings corresponding to each of, those Hamil each of those orbits in the sequence. And the continuation maps will correspond to multiplication by T. Now, the claim is that the limit of such a diagram is actually the entire Novikov field. And the way to see it is that instead of multiplying by t every time, you can just think of those things as modules over the Novikov ring, not as all of them being lambda at least zero, but rather lambda greater or equal zero embedded into uh, the, the, the collection of uh, sums where now I allow the exponents to be at least minus one, embedded into the collection of sums where the exponents are now at least minus two, et cetera. And so under this isomorphism, this multiplication by T just becomes embedding. And here it's easy to see that the limit is actually the union, thereby giving you the entire Novikov field. Now, the thing is, as I said, this completion not only completes things, it also does some kind of hexdorphization. And in this uh, uh, Novikov, uh, well, if you look at it in this uh, uh, definition, where well, you see that you are tensoring something which has no torsion with something that has torsion, so you get a limit of zeros. So it kills the contributions of such uh, uh, generators, which just climbed all the way to infinity uh, on those uh, upper parts of the orbits. It not, el not eliminates them totally because they, because they might send something down here under the, the continuation map. But at least this is the bigger, bigger picture of what, what this uh, expression means. And now one defines a symplectic cohomology as a Novikov ring model to be the cohomology of this symplectic cohomological complex. And in our case, we tensor, after taking cohomology, we tensor this with the Novikov field and, and we eliminate any torsion components. So these torsion components corresponds to finite bars. If you are familiar with uh, this barcode description of a filtered uh, flow air complexes. So we eliminate them, we are just left with the free part. Now, let me briefly recall the properties again. So we had restriction maps for uh, uh, compact sets, K prime inside K. We had this Meyer Viatory uh, uh, sequence for commuting sets and we had a ring structure. And moreover, the cohomology of the entire manifold is the quantum homology. Now, unlike say singular uh, uh, cohomology, uh, indeed, if we restrict from K to K prime and then from K prime to some other set or restrict directly, then on homology, we get the same map. But on chain level, we do not get the same map. That is the composition of two restriction or the direct restriction 
since it's built on uh, some choices of homotopies and uh, continuation maps, this is not the same. So everything that we work with at, on chain level actually is well-defined only up to homotopy and all the diagrams commute up to homotopy, et cetera. So this actually forces us to work in a certain model of uh, the infinity category of chain complexes. Now, as I said, our construction is roughly taking kernels of restriction to the complement. And to get quasi-multiplicativity, we have to introduce the notion of cohomology of pairs. So how we define it? Well, we define it to be uh, using the co cohen construction. So here it should read SC and not SH, sorry. So it should be the co cohen of the restriction map in chain complexes. So what is the co cohen So algebraically it has some concrete definition as the direct sum of uh, one complex with the other one shifted by degree and some triangular uh, uh, differential. But the way to think about it is that it's, it is actually a model for a homotopy kernel. So it actually satisfies a universal property, very similar to the one that kernel satisfies, only if you just insert the world up to homotopy everywhere. So instead of it measuring what vanishes, it basically measures what vanishes under up to homotopy, et cetera. And this uh, uh, Cocoon construction actually guarantees us a, an exact uh, sequence going from the a cohomology of pair to the cohomology of the first set to the cohomology of the second set, then back again with a shifted degree, et cetera. So why is that important? Well, recall, if, as I said, that the, uh, our IVQM has to do with the restriction in the kernel of restriction in cohomology. Now, since this is exact, this kernel is exactly given by the image of a map coming from some uh, cohomology of pair. So in order to prove the quasi-multiplicativity, what we have to do is actually construct a lift of the product to such pairs. So we had a product, say, on uh, SHM tensor SHM. We had some kind of pair of fence product due, due to Tonkonov and Varogunesh going to SH of M. And we have to lift this product to the cohomology of pairs such that it will go from cohomology relative to A, tensor cohomology relative to B, into cohomology relative to the union. Now, one may ask, what does this have to do with commuting pairs? So why do we require A and B commuting here? So just to give you some taste of uh, intuition, so recall what happens in a classical algebraic topology. So Varol Gunesh proved the ismayer vietori sequence for commuting sets. And on the other hand, in algebraic topology, we have that two sets satisfy Meyer Vietoris if they form an excisive pair. This is a property that's easier to describe actually in homology rather than cohomology. And it basically says that the natural chain map from the sum of a, a singular chains on A and singular chains of B into the singular chains of the union is an isomorphism in homology. So, you can think of commuting as being the symplectic analog of excisive pair from algebraic topology. Similarly, the relative cup product in classical uh, topology exists for an excisive pair. So it's natural to expect that we, it should, we should expect it to exist by only for a commuting sets in our case. And with that, I uh, conclude my talk. So thank you very much. Thank you, Yanni. Any questions? Oh, let's let's thank the speaker first, I guess. <laughs> but any questions? Yes, you or even prepared the slide with questions. <laughs> Please. <laughs> any questions? So I have maybe a, a very brief, I mean, a, a very brief question or clarification. Uh, you work a lot in Czech hom homology or cohomology. Why uh, it, is it because it's much easier to work in that setting? Uh, so you you, or it has you better properties. in the beginning where I described yes, yes, the, yeah, the beginning. Yes, 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 yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 So uh, let me go back to the corresponding slide. Right. And, uh, right. 
Um, so, or are, are the results actually false if you were use other kind of so, mode? Yeah, so Gromov's uh, result is actually false if uh, you work with a singular uh, uh, homology. And the reason it, this check is needed is that uh, those ideal valued measures uh, have this continuity axiom. I see, I see. I see. And okay. singular homology is not continuous. Sure. But, okay. But, but we could have worked with singular cohomology and instead of taking the check homology IVM, mm -hmm. we could have used singular cohomology, but force this IVM to be continuous using some regularization procedure. Ah, like you were and, saying with the union or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And so actually this would recover the same, the same IVM uh -huh. as, the, as, the, as, the, as, as the check homology. So basically you could work with singular cohomology, but then Gromov's result will look different. Instead of I rank see. restriction in cohomology, it would say different. something about co-dimension of uh, IVM of a complement of the fiber. I see. So, okay. okay, yeah, thank you. Welcome. Other, other questions? No other questions? Um, if no other questions, let's thank the speaker again. It's hard on Zoom. And uh, we will resume, we have another talk at 2.30. I'll leave the Zoom open, but uh, we have uh, the second talk in the series is uh, the floor memorial lecture by uh, Mohamed Abu Zaid. Uh, that will start at 2.30. Well, will by the way? Oh yes, no, so let, let me stop. Sorry, sorry. I, I will okay. trim. Sorry, just one second. It's good you reminded me. Where is it? Stop. Sorry. Excuse me. Just one second. Let me let me stop the recording. Okay. <laughs> uh.